I would like to uh, start off by acknowledging the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish First Nations that we're on, uh, specifically the uh, Musqueam Nation, who uh, hopefully, as Kim said, there will be a representative to do an official greeting uh, to their territory here on the, uh, the mouth of the Fraser River, which uh, Kim talked about, which is a, a great setting here in Richmond, uh, in in uh, the estuary of uh, one of the most uh, spectacular rivers on the planet. So that's uh, the, the setting for me. I'll um, advance. The, the title of, uh, of my presentation, Connect the Drops, is, as Kim mentioned, it's uh, you know, connecting the drops in terms of uh, doing things differently, new perspectives, taking advantage of, of the incredible assets we have in this room, in our communities, in our communities along the river, and within the province, uh, within the country, and around the world. So looking at uh, water in a different way, and I think uh, you know, Michael's theme, um, Blue Ecology, is really is, is what I, I think a lot of our presentations uh, this morning and this afternoon are leading to. Uh, so just um, a little bit about, to add to uh, Kim's uh, introduction, uh, a member of parliament for Port Moody Coquitlam. I've been an MP for eight years. Uh, before that, uh, I was a city councillor in Coquitlam, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the, in the presentation. I also am the founder and chair of the Rivershed Society of BC, which is a part of the presentation as well. But the one that I wanted to highlight um, is in keeping with the theme, the blue ecology of different perspectives working together, uh, Western science and traditional knowledge coming together is, um, in 1997, I was bestowed uh, an amazing honor of the name E.M. Yoyos, which means strong swimmer in the animal world. And uh, that's uh, the orca. And the reason the elders gave me that name is that if uh, orca are, are plentiful, it means the salmon they feed on are plentiful. So they gave me that responsibility to ensure that the salmon are plentiful. So that's the work that I've been doing uh, for a couple of decades now. And I think it fits in with, with this uh, presentation today. So I wanted to highlight that. So I think uh, I'm, I'm going to just mention some very basic uh, concepts and uh, some that I know uh, I'm, I'm hoping almost all of you realize are critical, but I would say that it's outside this room that we still have the challenge of uh, some of these basic concepts like nature as society and our economy depend on healthy watersheds. So it's a very basic thing, but I still find that people don't know what a watershed is. So I think that's what we are facing. Even though everyone on the planet lives in a watershed, they need water. All animals need water. It's a critical element. Um, so I wanted to start off with a very, very basic to make sure that we're OK. And I think Paul's going to help me out here with uh, showing a video, but uh, explaining what a watershed is. Uh, so a, a height of land draining into a common system of waters, in, uh, waters uh, creeks, streams, uh, and rivers, and uh, in, including the groundwater and the rain and, and snow. So this little video is about a minute long and will give you a little perspective. What is a watershed? Is it a shed that holds water? No. Nah. Try again. A watershed is all of the land that drains into the same location or body of water. People tend to think only of water bodies, such as rivers, lakes and wetlands, as being part of their watershed. However, any land, whether it is park, farm, forest, school parking lot, and even the soil we build our homes on, is also included. Think of a watershed as a funnel, collecting all the water within a specific area and draining into the nearest body of water. Drop by drop, water is channeled into soil, groundwater, creeks and streams, making its way to larger rivers and eventually the ocean. Everyone in the world lives in a watershed. Watersheds know no political borders, whether local, national or international. Our environment, our economy and our society all depend on a healthy watershed. So 
So that's just an introduction. Hopefully that's very basic for everyone in this room. Uh, but I think it's critical that we have that understanding of what a watershed is and our connection to water and our dependence on water. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit uh, of what we call uh, slightly different types of watersheds in, in our organization, the Rivershed Society. And as Kim put in, in the, uh, some of the promotional material to this conference, uh, what's a watershed, what's a rivershed, what's the difference? So I want to spend a, a few seconds talking about that. Um, so we look at uh, a watershed being the highest order of watershed, being a river basin, not a larger watershed than a river basin. And then we call the rivers that feed into a, a river basin, those river tributaries, river sheds. And then the creeks that feed into those, those rivers, those river sheds, creek sheds. So essentially those are the three levels of watersheds. They're all watersheds. Watershed is the generic term, like stream is a generic term. Uh, but watershed, uh, well I'll go to, um, I'll, I'll drill down into what, what we think is why we call a river shed uh, what we call it. But starting off, if you take that perspective of river basins, uh, this is a, a shot of, uh, it's hard to see, but uh, you have uh, the river basins of Canada here. And so you can see the Mackenzie, uh, one of the largest, is large, huge river basin uh, draining up to the Arctic. Um, you have uh, the Fraser, the Columbia, uh, Yukon draining into the Pacific. Um, and you have a a, a number of other river basins, St. Lawrence, the Nelson, and other uh, river basins that make up Canada. Um, now just focusing on British Columbia, since that's what we're uh, here today to look at, uh, we've taken a look at the river basins in the province. So you can see here's that portion of the Mackenzie that was uh, huge, but uh, this is uh, the, the northeast uh, portion of uh, the province. The Fraser River Basin, which is the largest intact river basin in the province. Um, and there's the, the Yukon up there. You have the Taku, the Stikin, uh, the Nass, the Skeena, uh, the, and then the Columbia down here. Now, we've, we've uh, hope, hopefully we're not offending anyone on coastal or, or uh, Vancouver Island when we haven't mapped out those river basins, because those rivers flow right into the ocean. Um, so we, we haven't uh, included them as uh, major river basins. I mean, we would probably call them river sheds at the scale that they're at, um, given that the size of these uh, rivers are on the river basin level. So that's uh, the hydrology of the province. And then moving into the Fraser, which we started to tackle back in 1995, uh, this gets a little more uh, detailed about what a river shed is. So we mapped out all the river tributaries to the Fraser, and we found that there were 32 main river tributaries. And then we broke them into regions because it was, the Fraser is you know, the size of the United Kingdom. It's a large area and a quarter of the province. It's a fantastic, uh, rich, diverse area. Um, made up of, uh, just looking at the hydrology, in incredibly different uh, hydrological areas. So we have um, mapped in six regions, and the regions are really socioeconomic in nature, not necessarily hydrological, even though they are based on hydrology. They're all within uh, the, uh, all, all the river sheds are within a, a region, are mainly to do with uh, how people talk to each other. So, for instance, um, when in the Fraser Headwaters, uh, I think this is a four, 13 different river sheds, uh, but most of these folks talk to each other from Prince George uh, to Dunster and Tijon in the Robson Valley. So that's essentially why we went with that as a region. There's one uh, anomaly, this river shed, which uh, is is on the, uh, the west side of the, of the uh, Fraser. Um, 
but it doesn't drain into the Nechaco, and the Nechaco is just a huge uh, area. It's a huge, it's, there's two exceptions to this, uh, the Fraser River Basin, which is the Nechaco, which is one huge rivershed, and the Thompson, and they are so large that they are regions in, uh, sub-regions in and of themselves. Um, all the rest are somewhat smaller and fit into regions. So this is where it gets a little more complicated, certainly to folks outside this room, about how uh, water flows. But certainly within government, this is nothing new. Um, we've been looking at how we ma manage forests, how we look at mines, how we operate agriculture, ranching, uh, industrial development. Uh, water is critically important. So this is partly what we've been doing uh, for educational purposes, but it also makes sense for uh, land use planning. And I'll get to that in a bit. Now, this one just shows uh, the river sheds, so the 32 river sheds. And it's, sorry, it's a very busy slide, but you get the, the idea that the Fraser is incredibly diverse. And I'm just, uh, and this is all available on our website as well. So if, if you're interested in going back and, and looking at, at these in more detail, um, we can encourage you to do that. So this is my, my busiest text slide, but I wanted to refer to why we use the term rivershed. I'm just going to read this. The term rivershed is gaining currency as one of the basic concepts of a sustainable society. So that's our focus, is really shifting to what a sustainable society is. Synonymous with watershed, the term is more place specific. So people understand when you talk about a specific river, uh, you know, the Coquitlam River, well, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, and it's, it steers the attention to a river in a particular geographical location and all activities and phenomena related to that area. Um, when a sense of place is organized around a river rather than a town or city, it encourages a mental shift from, hu from human settlement to the larger interconnected natural environment. So that's at least what I'm, we're hoping with the Rivershed Society. And I think it's what Michael's going to be talking about later today as well. So just to go back to an image, uh, this is a, a similar graphic, but shows uh, if you think about Rivershed in a different way, I just took uh, six examples of river sheds in the six, one from each region of the Fraser. So in the Fraser headwaters, the, the Goat River Shed, uh, the Nechaco I talked about, uh, below that is the Quinell River Shed in the Caribou Chilcotin region. Uh, the Thompson River Shed, I mentioned that as well with the north and south, the huge river system. Uh, and then the Seton River Shed comes in uh, around Lillooet in the Fraser Canyon. Uh, so the canyon section, and then the Coquitlam River Shed is just one in the lower Fraser, uh, which includes the estuary. There's also one, uh, two things that I didn't talk about that are what we would call white areas in the Fraser River Basin. One that we're in right now, which is the estuary. And then there's another portion that isn't necessarily directly in a river shed, which is the corridor. So there's the, the Fraser Corridor which are just little creeks that go directly into, into the main river stem of the Fraser as well. And that's critically, those are critically important areas. Certainly the estuary is a very, very critical area of the Fraser in the mouth of the river. But uh, it, you, know, you can take pretty much any river shed. Uh, so put, plug that, the name Coquitlam River, and you have uh, the upper Coquitlam then the lower Coquitlam, you would have the uh, Coquitlam Lake in there, and then it would feed into uh, the Fraser. So that's, that's very typical of many river sheds feeding into the Fraser River. And you can use that uh, model or, or thinking for, for almost any uh, type of watershed on the planet. OK, so just getting to watershed types and getting specific, again, as a summary on the Fraser, uh, so the Fraser River Basin, one of eight river basins in British Columbia, 32 river tributaries, and then there's hundreds of creek sheds within those, those river sheds. Now, the reason that we have spent some time on this is you have organizations that are at the provincial level or the basin level. So provincial government is a good example. Uh, Fraser Basin Council, good example at the basin level. 
And then there's the river shed level. And there's many watershed groups in, in British Columbia. They're at, at that level. Uh, Fraser Headwaters Alliance, the Quinell River Watershed Alliance, uh, the Brunette River Basin Task Group, the Rivershed Society of BC. So we're really at that scale. And then there's creek shed groups, many part of the stream keepers, uh, who do specific work on specific streams, a uh, lot of restoration. Uh, they do some education and, and enhancement as well. So, um, you know, this helps organize uh, the stewardship community, and hopefully that helps government. All right. So. Moving to back to the big picture on the Fraser, what are some of the features of this incredible river system? I could spend a lot of time talking about the features, but uh, one of the greatest salmon producing rivers on the planet. And it's essentially why it has been, uh, it has remained without a, a large dam on the main stem rivers because of those, those salmon. So very, very important. Um, it's Canadian and BC Heritage River. It is one of the most diverse rivers in watersheds in North America. It is uh, 10 of BC's 14 biogeoclimatic zones is represented within that area. So incredibly diverse from temperate forests to grasslands, deserts, right down to, again, the tempo, temperate forests and, and forest types in the lower Fraser and the estuary. Two-thirds of British Columbians live in this area, so it's a huge population, and a lot of the economy is generated in British Columbia within the Fraser River Basin. So significant from environmental, economic, and social, cultural perspectives. And uh, you know, I didn't even touch on the incredible history of the First Nations along this river system. So some of the threats, again, there's, there's many more than what is on this slide, but uh, and most of which you're familiar with. Uh, it's one of the most endangered rivers in British Columbia. It's been on the endangered rivers list for a number of years. Uh, it's, I think it comes down to overconsumption of resources and excess pollution. So those are the, I would say, the very, very basics about uh, if we, we consume too much, there's not enough for animals and plants. And if we produce too much, uh, what we call waste products, and I would say carbon being the biggest waste product that we are having a hard time dealing with, is uh, that is the, the environment can't absorb our waste and can't deal with it. So um, we are, because of that, faced with a changing climate and we are uh, affecting habitat for others uh, besides humans. So those are, those are huge impacts within the river basin to deal with. Um, urbanization, uh, rural resource extraction, uh, impacts from open net salmon farms. I had to get that in there because of my, my critic portfolio. Um, lack of regulation, monitoring, enforcement. And this one I want to talk about at the end, which I think is really important, is reduced funding to stewardship partners, which can allow government to go much further beyond the resources that it has from taxpayers with a multiplier effect by partnering with uh, stewardship groups on the ground in the community. Not just getting work done and more efficient, but also can oftentimes uh, provide social license to do things. Um, so I want to, at this point, say this is some background. I've talked about what a watershed is, introduced the Fraser, the different river sheds of the Fraser, some of the threats. Um, I'd like to show a video with Paul's help. A little bit longer, this is a seven minute clip. It comes from the Great Canadian River series and it's, uh, it's a 30 minute focus on the Fraser. I've just taken a seven minute excerpt. It, it focuses on the Fraser around Hell's Gate, gives you some background and introduces this little swim that I did down the river in 1995. And just to set it up, it was a, a three week swim back in 1995 started at the headwaters of the Fraser, which I'm sure everybody knows where that is. I didn't know where it was when I first started, up in Mount Robson, and finished right down here in Richmond on BC Rivers Day. So this one, uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Started off in six degrees Celsius water, and uh, when I finished, I had lost 
23 pounds and was, uh, was raring to go. But uh, this will give you a little overview of some of the, the history. It's being called the most savage river in North America. Arcing its way across British Columbia, the river roars down from the mountains to the sea. But its importance is perhaps best defined by one word, salmon. The Fraser River is the largest salmon producing system in the world. watershed in North America, from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast, from verdant forest to semi-arid desert. The Fraser River flows for 1,368 kilometers from source to sea. It travels with such velocity that water from the glaciers of Mount Robson will mix with ocean brine in just over a week. The Fraser drains an area of 234,000 square kilometers, almost a quarter of British Columbia. It begins about 35 kilometers southwest of Jasper on the western flank of the Continental Divide. It traces an S-shape through the province, turning south at Prince George, west at Hope, and ending at Vancouver, a sprawling metropolis on Canada's Pacific coast. It's hard to imagine that this mighty river begins in such a tiny trickle of a stream 2,100 meters up in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. As it rushes down out of the mountains, it drops two-thirds of its elevation in the first 150 kilometers. Propelled by gravity and fueled by the merging waters of its tributaries, the Fraser quickly gathers strength. About midway through its journey south, it uses that power to cut through a sedimentary plain carving a canyon three to five hundred meters deep, lined with spectacular cliffs and sculpted hoodoos. For 38 kilometers from Boston Bar to Yale, granite walls squeeze the Fraser River into an increasingly narrow channel. It's called Hell's Gate. At peak flow, the volume of water is twice the amount that flows over Niagara Falls, and it surges through an opening only 34 meters wide. The vertical walls of Hell's Gate presented a formidable challenge for the CPR, but a railroad was the price of admission for British Columbia to join Canada. Construction began in the spring of 1880. Sternwheelers steamed their way as far upriver as they could and established a base of operations at Yale. Thousands of workers flooded the area. It took four years and cost many lives, but the Canadian Pacific Railroad conquered the canyon. Disaster struck almost 30 years later during construction on a second line on the opposite side of the canyon. 
Mounting costs had led to construction shortcuts and rock debris from the blasting was allowed to just fall into the river. The channel became so congested that at least 90% of the spawning salmon were unable to get upriver, effectively destroying the salmon stocks on four-fifths of the Fraser system. A few were saved by natives who lifted the fish over the debris in their dip nets. Fishways were built in 1946. These concrete mazes gave the fish a helping hand by reducing the current from 32 kilometers an hour to five. But the problems facing the Fraser River salmon don't end there. A combination of climate change, overfishing, and industrial growth has further depleted the salmon stocks and there are no quick or easy solutions. The plight of the salmon first inspired swimmer Finn Donnelly back in 1990. I actually got started swimming environmental marathon swims in 1990 across Georgia Strait, which is the home of the salmon and thought in 1995 that I wanted to work on the birthplace of the salmon. I think some people understand the dependency on the Fraser and the importance of the river system. I think often um, in the urban centers that, that understanding, that relationship is lost. And that's one of the reasons uh, I'm doing this swim is to encourage a reconnection with, with river systems because they're actually good indicators of health of a, of a region. Donnelly swam the length of the Fraser, all 1,368 kilometers in 1995. Five years later, he did it again. I've had a range of uh, experiences from being extremely scared and nervous to feeling almost at home or at one with the river and in a sense that I'm working along with it. His support crew scans the water for dangerous currents and rapids and helps set up the community events that give meaning and context to his marathon. We work with schools and stewardship groups and local government and First Nations and we bring them together in, in community settings and we talk about the issues and we encourage sustainable alternatives for the, the new millennium. Tackling the environmental issues that plague the Fraser is a monumental task. But it's not unlike swimming its 1,368 kilometer length. You do it one stroke at a time. trajectory of my life and uh, that's the next part here I want to start talking about which is uh, founding the Rivershed Society of BC and um, I'm also going to mention that uh, there'll be a, an opportunity for questions uh, I've, I've got a few more slides and then uh, you know we I think we have uh, built in a fair uh, some time for for questions so uh, keep that in mind so uh, the Founded in 96, uh, our mission is to conserve, protect, and restore uh, the Frasers. I uh, put 34 because they included the, the corridor and the estuary, the, the, the Frasers uh, water courses within a generation. Our, our vision is to continue to see salmon flourishing in rivers and people flourishing in river sheds or communities. So our, our lens, if you haven't uh, picked it up, yet as people in salmon um, and the common thread there is both need clean water and healthy homes so healthy habitat um, so what we feel are some watershed solutions uh, raising awareness so the swims and some of the events the community events that we've been doing over the 20 past 22 years 
uh, is really largely focused on still raising awareness, uh, classroom programs, talking about what a watershed is, a river shed, and how you can, uh, how students can reduce their impact on rivers and river sheds. Um, education, showing how that is possible. Many incredible teachers around the province doing great work. So augmenting, building on, working with them. Um, and then public policy, having the political will to make these changes that we're discussing in this room. Um, I have to say, back when I finished the, the Fraser River swim uh, in 95, uh, the Premier was, at the time, was uh, very interested in having me connect to some of the classrooms in British Columbia under a new program that they were launching called the Urban Salmon Habitat Program. And I know Eric Bonham was very instrumental in allowing the Rivershed Society to get its beginnings uh, by continuing to work on the Urban Salmon Habitat Program. So. Uh, thank you to Eric, and that's a collaboration of government uh, working with a stewardship a community that I think is very, is essential and uh, is, is very beneficial to our community and to watersheds. And then of course best practices, so industry, uh, business need to demonstrate best practices, good land and water management, which is critical. Um, and we're partnering with uh, the Irrigation Society uh, or the Irrigation Association uh, in, in this conference. So that kind of collaboration is also incredibly needed and important. So we getting a little bit into the uh, river shed and what we're focused on, we've adopted this new term that we're using, uh, which is a health approach, looking at uh, applying watershed CPR. So we're, we're going after that, that health theme that you know, the, the river sheds or the watersheds need, need CPR. We need to apply CPR to get it back to good health. Um, but for us, that means conservation, protection, and restoration. So the conservation largely focuses on education, awareness, uh, public policy. The protection is also on what areas that we allow uh, to be developed and what areas that aren't, that we say are too uh, in significant or important for biodiversity, for plant or animal life to maintain, to have that, maintain that biodiversity. And then there's, there's areas, you know, down in the lower Fraser, for instance, but many other places as well where they're, they've been damaged so severely, we need to look at restoration. We need to restore those watersheds. So that's, for us, the uh, CPR model. So we, in terms of one of the conservation under the sea part, we've been uh, connecting with communities over the last uh, half a dozen years with a, uh, an event called Fraser Fest. And the Fest part is also on the sustainability side. So it's food, energy, shelter, and transportation is what we're eventually working around the Fest. So Fraser Fest it encourages people to connect with watersheds, their watershed. So we are getting them out canoeing in big canoes. Uh, biking, walking, uh, swimming. We had a swimmer last summer. And uh, in different ways, uh, connecting with uh, their watershed and also very much with native and non-native. So we, at the end of the day of activities in the watershed, uh, have a feast, uh, often with salmon, and the First Nations hosting. So that's the model that we've been using to uh, connect uh, people to their watersheds to increase the understanding of the watersheds and then encouraging CPR and highlighting watershed leadership because there's in the different regions of the Fraser there's tons of different groups doing incredible work. Uh, I know Louise Towell is here from Stream of Dreams and they've been doing amazing work uh, for 20 years. Uh, that's just one organization of a plethora of groups that many of you know of in different communities, uh, in different regions of the Fraser. So it's, I think, really important to highlight that work where we can. Um, we've also been doing a leadership program since 2002, so two years after my second swim of the Fraser, created a leadership program. We've had uh, 100 graduates go through the program since 2002. Um, we have a goal to put a leader in every Rivershed of the Fraser. So that's our, our focus, is to build stewardship capacity within those river sheds uh, through this program. Uh, next year, we want to create a Lower Fraser Regional Program. So we've been working with one of the sponsors of, of this uh, forum 
uh, the Real Estate Foundation of BC to look at how we expand, and that would be driven by the graduates of the program. They would create a smaller uh, mini SLLP in, in their region. So we're starting with the Lower Fraser with a three-day paddle to engage uh, university students uh, in that, that uh, particular program next summer. And then in uh, 2019, we're hoping to uh, have our graduates uh, create a, a regional chapter in, in the, lower Fra in the uh, Fraser Canyon. Um, so this is the last I'll mention of our programs that we're working on that uh, is uh, our newest that we are just getting out. It's in uh, concept mode right now. We're very excited about it. I think it'll be, if, if uh, it goes well, keeping us busy for the next 20 years of, of the work that we're doing. But the themes that we're under the water, Fraser Watershed Initiative are land use planning. It's obviously key, what we do on the land and in the water. Uh, habitat protection, so how do we protect those areas that are so critical? Again, for us, as we're using a salmon lens, so salmon habitat really important, and then restoring those areas. Uh, given that we just had uh, the largest fire uh, impacts in British Columbia in our history, that, uh, or at least recorded history last summer, uh, or this past summer, a uh, huge number or amount of the AAC, or the annual allowable cut, was burnt. And that's going to impact those uh, interior communities in terms of jobs and a way of living. It's also going to impact the hydrology of those watersheds. And so there's, while it's a, a hugely damaging uh, event that's happened, it's also an opportunity in terms of how we respond. So we're hoping to engage the federal, provincial, local First Nation governments to come together in terms of a restoration plan to look at, at that area and other watersheds within the Fraser. Um, ideally, bringing in a watershed guardians program or guardians. Uh, they exist in the, on the uh, coast and, and many other places around the country. Um, so they were successful at, at raising funds uh, to bring in, uh, in the federal budget, uh, to bring in guardians in a more uh, uh, systemic way. So we're hoping through the next round of funding that, uh, that there could be some focus on the, the Fraser watershed. Uh, in terms of uh, guardians. And uh, so many of this is not possible without partnership. Obviously, the Rivershed, we're a small uh, nonprofit organization. We need to connect with other partners to do the delivery of uh, much of this work. And then again, uh, connecting corridors is just connecting with uh, areas that have already been uh, working on outside of the river basin uh, and connecting those, uh, those large habitat areas. Um, some of the threats to work on, obviously, climate change. It's an overarching issue. We're not getting that right in many areas. Many departments federally are failing. Uh, they recognize that in terms of resilience and ad adaptation. So working on climate change is, is going to be incredibly important. As Kim has said, the future is now. And we're seeing those impacts now. Uh, cumulative impacts. We know that it's... Uh, more than one or two or three, it's a multitude of stressors impacting our water and our watersheds. So cumulative impacts, incredibly important. Uh, we're losing species, so endangered species. Um, and there's hopefully a federal, uh, in it, uh, there's a willingness to tackle uh, under SARA uh, how we, just how we recover those species or adapt. And then uh, loss of salmon habitat, that is again one of the focuses for us within watersheds of the Fraser, and loss of biodiversity. So those are a range of threats and themes that we hope to address under that uh, Fraser Watershed Initiative. Um, I want to finish by talking about what Kim alluded to in the beginning, which was, uh, for me, the, the dual track of conservation and politics started in 2002 when I got elected to Coquitlam City Council. Uh, in fact, uh, just backing up, in 95, when I finished that Fraser River swim, there was a group of community folks that said, Finn, you've got to run for council in 96. I said, no thanks, I'm just politics, no way. <laughs> but I had just uh, wanted to start the Rivershed Society and, and uh, continue to go on the road, go into classrooms and talk about the, uh, the swim and the impacts and how you can be, uh, the students can be a part of, and community members can be a part of change. So that 
uh, is what I focused on. 99, again, I got asked to run for council. I said, no, I'm going to reswim the Fraser in 2000. But in 2002, I, I finally caved in. And that started the dual track of focusing on uh, education and awareness, as well as public policy. So the one story I want to mention is what Kim referred to was that OCP amendment. So over the seven years, there were many battles. I could talk about streamside protection regulations and uh, all sorts of development challenges. But uh, this, when I was a, a newly elected uh, city councillor, uh, green in many ways, uh, as Kim referred to, the planning department was like, OK, this guy, let's, he's not going to shut up. We better give him something. So let's give him this one. He has been pushing for this amendment. and. Luckily, my colleagues, and you could, it's hard to read there, but this is back in May of 2003, and I'd already been talking about how to, you know, uh, do watershed planning before we do development plans or neighborhood plans. Like, how does it make sense that we could do a watershed plan during a neighborhood or a development plan? It just, I couldn't comprehend it. But the, the planners could, so could the developers. No problem. They could accommodate that. But uh, so I just couldn't comprehend that. But uh, so I, I made for this uh, small uh, four forward change, which is uh, during or before during a, a watershed plan, and said, let's eliminate that. So it's watershed plans that happened before development plans. Luckily, I had four other colleagues that agreed with that. So uh, you know, it was a nine-member council, and that's what it took to uh, to get that approved. And that, as Kim pointed out to me years later, was a very, very important change that many other municipalities look to, uh, because certainly municipalities look at how do we keep up with you know, the Joneses kind of thing. So it's how do we adopt best practices? And they look to other municipalities for those best practices. And that one little change was something that I feel proud of to be part of, thanks to Kim pointing that out to me years later, that it made a difference. So you never know where the next watershed solution will come from in your community or in, in our communities. So we have to be open and aware, uh, looking for those, those uh, partnerships, those uh, different perspectives, uh, encouraging you know, others to get into public policy, uh, to, to do uh, the needed work. Because if we're not standing up for that needed public policy, certainly the others who are advocating to keep that bar low will win out. And that's, that has been a concern of mine, certainly, as I've been in politics. So I think uh, final, oh, I'll do my summary here. Um, we all live in watersheds, as I uh, stated off in the beginning and as our, our video reinforced. But I think many are still largely unaware of the importance of watershed integrity and, and connection to our health or to our well-being. So that part, I think we still need a lot of work on, is making that connection, is why are watersheds important? How are they important to our own health? Um, I think we need to transition. It's a new day. We n must transition to watershed co-governance. Uh, First Nations are winning in court case after court case in the Supreme Court of Canada and British Columbia. Precedent-setting cases are there. We need to find out ways of how we work together efficiently, effectively, native and non-native governance. So that, I think, is critical. That will, I think, lead or move to uh, improving watershed planning and decision-making, better decisions. Um, if we can find out uh, ways to uh, bring our nations together for those uh, decision making. Um, and finally, as, as Kim mentioned, I think it's critically important that we find ways in this room to better communicate with each other and outside this room, community to community, federal, provincial, First Nation, local, regional, uh, governments, stewardship communities, business community. How do we work together? Using, I would, I'm going to suggest the natural unit being the watershed as, as the uh, natural managing unit. And uh, we as uh, watershed practitioners and advocates coming together, thinking of, of better ways. Hopefully today will be a part of that day to figure out how we work better together. 
Um, it's, I think, time for local and provincial government to support stewardship in British Columbia in a more formal way. I would say there's been an absence uh, since uh, the late 90s, early 2000s, in terms of uh, a significant partnership, and I think that's a critical thing that uh, we need to re-engage in moving forward from today. So that, that's me, and I want to open it up to questions. Yeah, thank you first, though. Oh. <laughs>